Welcome to Hickory Street Podcast. Uh, this is going to be a guest episode um, with Dean. Dean, what's your last name? Marshall. Dean Marshall, mm-hmm. who is the production manager of the After Dark Podcast. And uh, Dean is probably the most creative sound engineer i've ever worked hmm. with well i wouldn't tell me too much of a sound engineer i'm more focused on video but sound comes second to that because you have shit videos if you uh can't hear them right <laughs> yeah so well the uh you know typically whenever people are doing this kind of work they're very left brain you know what i mean mm-hmm. like they don't they don't come with many creative ideas and i think part of the reason why we work so well together is because we bounce ideas off of each other, and it's almost like you mentioned several times before, you know, whenever you have an idea, it's like I'm thinking the same thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. A um, thousand percent. I mean, uh, even just the After Dark podcast was something that I was thinking of, and I was trying to figure out how I was going to get it done, uh, who I would need to know to, like, reach out to the community and musicians in general. Um but then you reached out to me maybe like three days after I started thinking about it and just said, Hey, you mind if I do this? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Like, that's exactly what I've been thinking. This is what I want to do. Um, so yeah, there's been a ton of times that like I've come up with something in my own head and Mike's hit me up like, Hey, what if we did this? I was already thinking that What what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the cool things about starting this was that, um, it happened at such a weird time in my life. <laughs> uh, you know, I was simultaneously getting the most hate from the music community that I was working so hard to like keep thriving, you know? And so, um, it was just really strange cause I felt like I was being shit on every day mm-hmm. <laughs> and that there was someone new that, you know, um, I thought was behind me that was really trying to stab me in the back. And so whenever I got this opportunity, the fact that, you know, you stood behind me and we found a way to, to move forward without any of the, the weirdness of the circumstances affecting the show itself was really important to me specifically because it was something that I was working really hard to, to, um, kind of not pay attention to. I was just trying to, I I was trying to move on with, despite having all of these negative feelings, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know what I mean? Cause I don't know, it's just like one of those things that makes your your stomach sick whenever a lot of, you like know a lot of people don't like you, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, um, like it's not, it's not like you're like, oh man, this sucks, nobody likes me, but it's just like this visceral feeling of knowing that people are saying something that like deep down you know is not who you are um, and not what defines you and like trying to figure out how do I move forward forward or how do I explain to everybody like this is not it this is not this is not it and um you know it's it's tough it's not easy um but you get that you, you, almost like gut punch you know it's mm-hmm. it's visceral it's really visceral yeah it's uh and you know just in this day and age um it's just so easy for someone to say something bad about you without any context or like taking any time to to get to know you and um just kind of like growing up the way that I did I was sort of I was sort of uh I don't know. I, I I grew up as an outcast from my circumstances. Uh, my my family didn't come from 
money and I was surrounded with people by people who like didn't have to worry about the the same things that I had to worry about and uh you know they had like more stable home lives and so it almost feels like in my in my life as I've progressed and gotten the achievements that like were markers of success for me as I've achieved those things, I like simultaneously always end up feeling the same way I did whenever I was just that awkward kid in school surrounded by people that were much more secure and much more put together like emotionally. And so it, it, whenever things like this have happened in my life, it makes it takes me back to a like a dark place like a like a place where i always where i feel like i'm that you know defenseless kid again but i'm i'm not you know what i mean and mm-hmm. something that uh i i i really kind of learned through my my dad cuz my dad has been the the most positive influence in my life i would say is that uh, d- adopting that victim mindset can be a, a perpetual downward spiral if you're not careful. And so, um, whenever I whenever I come into contact with like people people like you who give me the benefit of the doubt and essentially say, you know what you know, fuck those people <laughs> that are, you know, that are just trying to hate on you for virtually no reason. Um, it, it, it makes, it, it kind of, it, it gives me that assurance and confidence that like I'm on the right path. And I don't know if you've ever had moments like that in your life where you kind of felt like you were getting attacked by, by all angles of life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, like starting, uh, this job was, uh, a struggle in general, um, being, you know, managing the studio space for Chilton. Um, and, you know, I won't go into a ton of detail, but it felt like the entire world was out to get me at that moment. Uh, and there was just no way to get past it, but, um, I just had to keep pushing through, uh, you know, make myself known that I know what I want and I know what I'm worth. Uh, and I'm not going to take anybody telling me, you know, no, I, um, and I ended up here because of it, uh, doing a job that, you know, it's not the best paying or anything, but it's a job that I love. And it's, um, they say never, you know, don't do something you love or you'll never work a day in your life or do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Um, I don't think that's a hundred percent true, but at least I'm excited to go to work instead of like, Oh God, got to enter this TPS report again. You know, I do some (laughs) number I don't care about, you know? Hmm. Yeah. But, and what's really good about pursuing something that you're passionate about, at least, you know, for me and I'm sure for you too, but whenever you're pursuing something that you're passionate about, Um, you can kind of, and this is like the, the trick, right? Uh, the sooner you let go of material success, the sooner you actually feel successful. Oh yeah. Has has, that, that's been my experience. A hundred percent. Um, cause you know, I have, um, so I did end up or growing up from like a semi wealthy background. Right. Um, my, my family was well off. They were upper middle class, which I know you're going to say doesn't exist anymore, but at the time, uh, that's what it was. And I got super lucky in the housing market and all sorts of stuff. Um, so, you know, they've always been well off, um, and the pressure I get from them where it's like, you're not making much money. You need to do more. You're not doing enough. You need to do more. I'm like, it's not what interests me. I'm not here to make, you know, a million dollars or whatever. Granted, that's not what they're looking for. Right. But, um, it, they're, I'm not here to make 
you know, as much money as possible or, you know, focus on how to expand myself. You know, if there's a good enough opportunity, of course, I'm going to take it, but it has to be something that I'm interested in and I'll feel comfortable working at. Uh, the big thing about working at a job like this is this is already what I'm passionate about, uh, which is helping the community. I feel like I'm giving back. I feel like I uh, am supporting people in some way and I uh, am fulfilling that role at the same time as doing something that I am interested, genuinely interested in, which is video production, audio production, engineering for video and audio production, um, and whatever I can do, you know, uh, it's a, every day there's a new request and that's kind of the fun part of it. Mm, yeah. 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 That's, uh, you know, the, the fact that you are doing what you love to do despite, you know, how much it may or may not pay mm. is, uh, it's a big leap of faith that a lot of people take and, that was something that was pushed on to me quite a bit because my family doesn't come from, you know, very uh, very wealthy backgrounds or anything. I mean, both my parents struggled, um, mm. and, you know, it, it. I was hit so hard with the reality of um, economics and its impact on families purely because my dad uh you know he was in the housing sector and his industry entirely vanished 2008 during, in, yeah in 2008 and so yeah. it was right as i was you know g becoming uh, a preteen um i was in middle school when it happened and you know i was in first grade whenever 9 11 happened mm -hmm. and uh these things like they really pushed me to pay attention to the world without taking um without taking too much in at the time you know what i mean like i i be, just being exposed to it was enough for for me to kind of go down the rabbit hole of like where where are we headed as a as a country even and and how do we make our circumstances the best they can be at this time, you know? Yeah. And uh, getting out of the 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 whole, like, oh, well, I, I come from this background, so all these people are evil, doesn't seem very productive. You know what I mean? Yeah, well— There's there's this thing that I've, I've dealt with, right? Like, I, I see wealth be— mismanaged misused in so many different ways mm -hmm. um and um and and my background you know um there it wasn't like you know i had anything given to me or whatever um but i didn't have to worry about um you know if i had an issue i could fall back on my family they would take me in and i'd be okay and i i ran into that a few times and i'm really thankful for the fact that i had that opportunity um but at the same time there was never a moment where I was like, don't worry about it. You don't have to work. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. There was always the push to get me to go be my own person. Um, and what made it even more stressful is that um, my my parents were also wildly focused on how much things cost. So they would be over-focused on like, well, you can't do that because you don't make enough, even though it wasn't true. So for, for a while, I was paying rent to my parents because they, all they would tell me is I could never move out. I'll never be able to afford it. I'll never be able to afford it. Um, and, you know, I finally snapped and said, I'm done. I'm going to move out. And everything was fine. I was able to afford it. <laughs> um, and I had done, you know, spreadsheets upon spreadsheets to try to figure out to make sure it was okay before I did anything radical. But it, it's almost like um, there's this idea of wealth that's not always true but there's this there's still a huge mismanagement um like just overspending people living beyond their means yeah and on top of that you have um you just such a high concentration as well that it's causing rippling issues where like 
you know, if you think about every dollar in somebody's pocket is one that's outside of the economy, um, after a certain point, right, there's no way they can spend it. Suddenly you have you know, estimated trillions that are just no longer in the economy because they're in one guy's pocket or two guys pocket, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So suddenly you run into those issues, but, <clears throat> um, what, what's nice is that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not struggling. I'm not, um, I'm not failing. I'm not like calling my parents, Hey, I need money or whatever, but I'm not, doing what they expect um right and fighting that issue especially when my brother is just hitting exactly what my family expects uh is really interesting um but it's liberating in a sense because it uh gives you the feeling of starting something on your own rather than following in somebody else's footsteps Mm. um yeah so so in a lot of ways you have deviated from the familial norms that were sort of imposed on you and now you're kind of noticing the behavioral changes of your parents and your brother and stuff Um, like that well you know i i wouldn't granted living outside of your parents place you know it it makes it much easier when they're not fighting about stuff because they're right right across the you know in a different room right yeah um (laughs) but uh there's you know there's stuff like um i'll bring up like hey you know i uh, my girlfriend and i are looking at getting a uh like renting out a house and i'll just hear the constant like you can't afford that you don't make enough there's no way you could possibly afford that um Mm. don't even think about trying because you you're gonna fail and then you're gonna come back and talk to me again or something and it's like well i've i'm doing this fine for the past five years you know i don't know why all of a sudden it's an issue but you you know i'm really glad you brought that up actually because something that i have noticed um you know growing up i i watched my dad and my stepmom work so hard to make sure that i didn't have anything to worry about I mean, they busted their ass, and I think seeing that as a kid um, and being put into that situation where maybe I wasn't feeling the immediate threat, but they were, and I could I could see how, you know, all it would take was just uh, the wind blowing in the wrong direction, and we might be in a bad spot, you know? Mm-hmm that really shaped who I was because I was a teenager around this time and um, I wanted to be lazy (laughs) just like every other teenager. But my, you know, my dad pushed me not to be, he made sure that I did things around the house and that he taught me how to do things construction wise. And um, whenever I, I, you know, I had a very different moving out experience. Uh, I sort of got into argument after argument with my parents and wanted to be on my own. And at 19, uh, my dad said, you know, well, I think it's time that you find your own place. And so I just moved out with no plan at all. I didn't, (laughs) I I, I didn't, you know, I was making like $10 an hour at my lifeguard job. And I moved in with a friend and slept on his floor for like three months before I ended up getting a job um, working at a call center for like 15 bucks an hour, driving a car that was, you know, uh, Ill- like illegal, essentially. I was getting the, you know, registration done, you know, very shadily. <laughs> and um, I, I, uh, I somehow made it work. And despite getting pulled over for speeding a couple of times, I just got really lucky and um, n- I I realized at some point that it wasn't the fact that I didn't make enough money that was holding me back. It was the idea that I wasn't making enough money that was holding me back. And I ended up getting a job right out of college, making exactly what I was making when I first started that call center job. And within two years, I saved up $10,000. And that was just because I was smart with my money. And I budget. And yeah, and and I I knew 
uh, I knew a lot about health, and I understood that how much I was eating was probably unhealthy, despite the fact that everybody around me was telling me that I was fine, that I was, you know, uh, that I that I was, yeah, I should probably eat more, you know, um, but that was like the biggest misconception, the biggest barrier for me that I had to overcome in my life, which was getting out of the idea that I wasn't making enough money and utilizing what I was making to create the life that I wanted. And unfortunately, during COVID, a lot of that ended up being depleted because I needed to use it to make ends meet. And I had a lot of uh, unexpected car issues. Um, but I still held on to a lot of that savings. And it's, uh, you know, in a place that's pretty untouched. And um I think that my perception of, like, people who come from your background um, was a very, it was a very negative perception to have because really what it was, it was just a barrier from, for me um, and getting to know someone and getting, you know, get, getting able to collaborate and work towards something together. We're all getting fucked by the billionaire class, right? <laughs> like we're all getting fucked by the billionaire class. We're not different, right? It's, mm. it's this idea of, you know, if we're going back to, uh, all this stuff, like clash con class consciousness, which I'm sure is spoken about enough in mm -hmm. the modern age, but, mm -hmm. um, it, it's like, um, there's this idea that, you know, everybody's different in some way, uh, because of their background and it's true, but we're also so incredibly similar, um, that, you know, there's not like, you know, buddy across the street who has a completely different upbringing than me is still a person and still somebody I can relate to in some way, you know, right. yeah. um, it doesn't matter who you are we all are dealing with the same shit just slightly differently. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you know, like you were dealing with making, uh, whatever, uh, you said, what, $10 an hour at moving out. Um, I, I wasn't moving out yet, but I was making under minimum wage working as a manager at a pizza place. And I had no idea they were fucking me that hard until <laughs> oh, like no. for almost a year. Um, I just was not looking at my paychecks closely enough. Um, and so I had to jump through odd jobs because I, you know, I didn't go directly through the college, you know, system. Um, it was something that I came back to. Um, so I, I dealt with, you know, working in odd jobs and doing weird things. And, um, luckily I, you know, would focus and persevere and try to find the jobs that I enjoyed. But, uh, at the same time, knowing like I can do any type of work somebody throws at me as long as I do focus and work hard. There's some exceptions. Uh, what actually sent me back is I worked uh, as a uh, sales rep for Reliant Energy. Mm -hmm. I completely walked into that job. There's the guy who was hiring was quitting the next day and he did not give a shit. And my resume <laughs> had nothing on it that would work in this. And I was... 20 years younger than the next person next oldest person that worked at this position oh wow um that was the worst job i've ever worked in my life and that's what sent me back to school uh because you know i it was good money i was making i think eighty five thousand a year but i only lasted a month so really mm. was it eighty five thousand a year right. not really <laughs> um so you know it it's this this feeling of like needing to understand that like work is work everybody is doing work um not everybody but you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah. Al almost everybody is working in some capacity and those the jobs that those people do should not be um like minimized um you know i there's even within like small hierarchies and power dynamics at work, like, you know, managers and bosses and things like that, you, you deal with people who are like, Oh, because I have this higher title, I'm better than you. And it's like, no, you're a moron. If you think that way, everybody's doing work, you're doing work. These people are doing work. It's just as hard. It may feel harder to you because you're doing, you're watching them do their work and doing your work outside of that. Mm -hmm. But it's not at all like, you know, gray, my assistant, um, 
they do the same job I do, but for what, 20 hours a week. Um, and I push them to take over more and more of my role so that they can learn. But at the same time, I am right there working with them in tandem to get it done. And that's not all they do. They have, you know, an entire schooling that they need to take care of. So there's no way in hell I'm going to try to make their lives hard, right? Like, yeah, I sure I'm their boss. I don't think I'm better than them. What I think I what I think I have is, hey, I know some things. You know some things. If I teach you the things I know, you'll be smarter than I am, and you'll go off and do something even better. Um, it's just it's ridiculous when you see people who are like, oh, I'm. You know, I make a hundred thirty, hundred forty thousand dollars a year. I'm better than you. Fuck off. Fuck off. Yeah, that's you, the that's the that's the ego trap of money. Um, because I kind of I I will be honest, I kind of fell into that a little bit too. Like, even though I, you know, just finally being able to afford the things that I want was like a huge thing in my life because there were so many times in my childhood that I would want something and I ne- and I never got it, and so, um my perception of other people in their position literally made me depressed um, and made me feel like quote unquote the other, you know what I mean? And now what's weird is that now that I've done all of this work and I've, I've worked my ass off and I've gotten to where I am now, even though it's, you know, in the grand scheme of things, probably just a few steps um, in a direction that maybe you know, the next person has not made yet. But um, just even through that experience, uh, I'm now on the other end of that where I've noticed that uh, specifically like people in the music scene or um, people, uh, you know, in my job and like in my career uh, will look at me because of my age and um, assume that I don't deserve the things that I have without knowing anything about me. That, you know, th- thinking that I kind of just fell into these things because um, I was, you know, I-, I was awarded. I was I was always given what I was what I wanted as a kid or something. You know what I mean? And yep. it doesn't always work out that way. And uh, I do understand like the the monetary imbalance that exists in our society and it's something to take note of but i i honestly i honestly think that the the majority of people that end up where they end up in life is not by an accident you know what i mean like i really think that the people that end up in some "Quote unquote uh, high earning positions or like uh, high earning fields, um, or even unexpectedly, like I mean, think about how many people are making all of their money from podcasting or like yeah. all of their money from music, and you could sit there and say, oh, they don't deserve that, oh, they don't deserve that, but at some point, after it happens enough times, and you notice that these people all have different backgrounds." To, 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 you can't really take that away from people. You yeah, know what I, mean? I think, you know, as a society, we're doing a lot better at that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's still a struggle. There's still a lot of work to be done to truly create a meritoc- or meritocracy where, you know, you can have people from any background work a similar amount and end up in the same place. But, you know, granted, we're not all started off and dealt with the equal hand right yeah um but at the same time you have to acknowledge that when somebody works really hard at something they will end up there and it's not just uh like a a handout quote unquote or like lucky right Mm -hmm. um there's obviously work that is involved um and the really when i'm complaining about like wealth stuff it's like people who literally do not work and just are living off of passive income that they get from other people. That's the shit that fuck that, you know? Yeah. Um, but if you're working, you know, you're putting an effort, you're trying, you're working hard. Um, that's the stuff that really matters. Um, and yeah. you, between all of us, we're all, we're all working our asses off, you know, we're all trying to do the best we can and sure. Maybe outliers out there, but 
I, I beg to differ that 90% of people that you talk to will be like, yeah, I've been working really hard on this thing, or I've been working really hard on that thing, or, you know, I've, I've been struggling through X, Y, and Z that I had to do at work. That's how life is. You know? Yeah. And you, you know, it's the, the craziest thing that I have noticed, not only in my career, but also specifically like in the music scene and other art like scenes and industries is that the things that make someone you know successful in a way is not the externalities it's the mindset it's the internalities it's the the uh, attitude that people have that actually takes them further than um, their environment would typically allow for. Yeah, it's like looking at your job and saying, how can I use this to improve myself rather than how can I get through the grind? Right, or right. serve a community. Yeah. Um, you know. um, so... Because that's, isn't that essentially what, like, uh, even high-level positions like lawyers do? Yeah, I mean, well... They're, they're serving a community Yeah, in it, a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, Um there's some there can be you know there's there an can, argument to be had there but. yeah well <laughs> it depends on you know what type of lawyer to, you're talking about right but right. in general yeah um i think uh like for example i i before i worked in this i was uh, a chef right um i worked as a chef for a year and a half um and it it feels like complete happenstance but at the same time i worked there or i worked in kitchens for I think six years at that point. Um, and I needed like three years experience. Uh, so it kind of worked out. Um, and, um, I was surrounded by all these incredibly hardworking people and like who had done amazing things and were incredibly smart. Um, and I felt like I didn't belong because I, I felt like I had done nothing in comparison to these people. You know, there were people with like master's degree in gastronomy and stuff like that. And I'm like a guy who flipped burgers for five years. And here I am doing like, you know, like lobster and like tomahawk steaks. Um, but I constantly got good performance reviews because I went to work and said, how can I learn to make this food? so that you know i can go home and make it myself sometime i know how to make it cheaper than what i could get at a steakhouse if i ever want to take somebody to a nice dinner i'll yeah, make it at home that's really smart there's a lot of value in that <laughs> yeah yeah uh and so same with this stuff you know it's it's mainly that i love serving the community but at the same time i go i really like making videos how can i make my own videos at home like i have an entire art por portfolio of stuff i've shot that i don't show anybody ever because it's just for me and it's just stuff that I like. Um, I don't, you know, there's a whole argument that I've had with people back and forth where they're like, that's selfish. I don't give a shit. It's my stuff. Leave me alone. You yeah. know, I, um, I mean, music is selfish in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, you know, whenever you write a song, typically you're trying to get to the bottom of your understanding of it. Um, it because the only perspective you can look at things from is your perspective a lot of the time. And you can, I mean, obviously you can put yourself in other people's shoes, but um, part of the reason why people uh, like music is because of its authenticity and yep. like if if you're not being true to your take on things or not, not trying to highlight absurdity in a way that you understand it then uh, a lot of the times it just comes across as being inauthentic and people don't people don't connect to that yeah um did you ever take any criticism classes on like art no, uh, I actually, all, my entire time at UNT, I really didn't take any sort of art appreciation or music appreciation class, which is really kind of ironic. Yeah, but, uh. <laughs> uh, there's a, you know, there's a, a thought in uh, critique. It's exactly that inauthentic idea, right? Um, but you see when you're going through like high school and stuff, the professor or the, the professor, the teachers always have like a way of viewing whatever book it is or whatever um you know and the symbolism involved and sure some of that's probably intentional but uh the big thing about art that i've taken away from all my criticism classes is that it is what you make of it 
And when people analyze it, it's looking inward at yourself and how you view societal norms. So you may see something completely different in this film than the guy down the street um, or across the road or wherever, you know. Um, It's all about what you take from it and what you feel from it. Uh, And it's the feeling, emotion, and thoughts that go into creating that art that people can feel, which makes good art. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not necessarily like technical skill. Like for God's sakes, look at Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's one of the most beloved movies around the world and it is horrible quality. Like there's a lot of really cool stuff in it, but it's very simple. Yeah, I watched a documentary on that movie and uh, it it almost fell apart so many times. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And (laughs) there there were some actors that literally just like walked off set and said they weren't coming back. Yeah, yeah, because, <laughs> so. um, you know, there's this there's this collective vision that you, it, like, the way I like to look at it in film is there's a collective vision that you have to work towards as a group, right? Uh, it's, it's similar in bands where you have a collective vision of your song or a collective sound of your song that you all work towards to make. Um, and it's something that, all of you in the band have to understand and feel or otherwise you won't get that authentic sound. Um, and sure you, you have some bands like pop bands. Sometimes it's like, whatever, it just sounds kind of cool. Sure. But that's the feeling that they have and people are looking for that. They're not looking for something deeper. Right. Mm. Um, but you have, you know, genuinely good music out there that, uh, is popular because it has an idea that is shared through a medium and others can pick up on how that feels. Um, They might not see the exact same thing that was intended, but they can see something that reflects back to them. And that's why everybody has different tastes. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, so one piece of art is never the entire puzzle. It's always just a piece, just like anything else. And that's something that I've, uh, I've noticed kind of societally, I guess just with access to social media and, um, the, just all of the information that exists out there. The, I think part of the problem is that a lot of people take the piece as the, the whole the whole yeah and it's never just that no and um I, I i think that like the part of the problem of just like the restricted this restrictive nature of art right now is that they're finding the pieces that they don't like and throwing them away and th- i think that happens irregardless of whether or not we're talking about now or, you know, 20, 30 years ago, even 50 years ago. But um, what's what's unique about uh, just the, the access to social media and the Internet is that uh, it's sort of immediately pointed out and disregarded by a, like a group of people, and then there's there's like an entire other group of people that accepts it which is partly why uh, a lot of comedians have been simultaneously the most hated and the most beloved in uh, our culture right now. And uh, I think that as a society, we need to start rejecting uh, the people out there who are the most vocal about disdain for uh, a person or their art for whatever reasons, because their 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 motivations can only be selfish. I because you know what I mean. Like it there's can, somewhat there's there's a it's a rant that I've had where there's a collective regressive regressivism on art right now, um, in the sense that we are falling towards uh, more of a uh, and it's it's I'm sure you heard a little bit about this and, you know, history degree stuff, but like a fascist ideology of art, which is it's very boxed in, it's very selective. Um, and the, and 
God, it's a lot to explain. But um, yeah, and it's complicated. It's extremely it, complicated. There's, there's a lot of different layers and reasons why it's occurring. Yeah, um, but you see things like like Marvel films, for instance. You know, um, they've become so mainstream and focused and pushed and watched by you know millions and millions and millions of people. But at the same time, they follow like a box formula and are super restrictive on what's allowed and controlled and when anything deviates ever so slightly from the norm people are like oh my god it's amazing it's so different than all the others and you know if you watch anything other than that in film you're like yeah they're doing crazier shit like 10 years ago just look at that like right i mean way crazier you even you even watch uh movies from you could, like you the, could watch Gaspar No. If you've never seen that guy, watch a Gaspar No movie. It'll blow your goddamn mind. You'll freak out at how crazy and weird they are. He just released a movie that's two movies at the same time. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> it, he. I. Well, it might not be out yet. Um, I believe it's called. It's a Whirlwind or Twister? Not Twister. Whirlwind or something like that. I don't remember. I haven't watched it yet. Uh, I did watch. And loved uh, Climax, which was an amazing movie. Mm. Um, but it's a Climax is half the movie is an introduction to the movie, the credits roll, and then the rest of the movie is one shot. The entire movie. Wow. And, you know, 1918 or whatever it was tried to do that, but they faked their one shots. This whole one is just mm-hmm. one take. It's no stopping on rolling. The whole thing just acts out like a giant play that the camera's just moving That is through. so cool. It's really awesome. Um, and uh, this other one is essentially like he separates the cameras and creates two stories simultaneously of two different points of view of the same thing. So you can still follow along. You're not like, oh, one movie's going and I'm watching another movie at the same time. But it's essentially two movies, um, which is insane um that's it that's genius yeah that is so genius um and so you know like you have people talking about like whoa uh the new doctor strange is crazy they got like bones and stuff and they're like doing special effects in different places yeah well, shut up i don't care like <laughs> whatever go look at gaspar no he's crazy this guy this man is insane he's you know i you can look at like Gummo. It's not a Gaspar No, I can't remember, but it's set up like a documentary in Oklahoma about like extremely impover- impoverished children, and it's super weird. Or you can look mm. at like, uh, I don't know. Uh, everybody talks about uh, uh, Tarkovsky is like their big influence in film if they're like a film nerd because he's crazy and insane but beautiful at the same time with like uh the stalker or just stalker i guess um as the big film that stand out and he died because of that movie he got in you know he went into a polluted lake and shot in the polluted lake uh and the shots in the film uh not him in the polluted lake but the shot of the polluted lake it's damn it's you know there's these there's there's a lot of irony and sadness to that Uh. yeah i mean it's the arrogance of a filmmaker right the whole point of um the whole point of the idea of the auteur is that uh it needs to be a singular mind that's coming up with these ideas and others assisting to create it but it just doesn't work that way anymore and sure you can put the auteur theory to test with certain people like uh i don't know um God, what's his name? Uh, I know this is going to be the worst uh, choice for uh, explaining it, but Big Eyes and Edward Scissorhands. Okay, yeah. Um, What's his name? I forget. Um, But, you know, all of his films feel similar, sure. Um, But there's such a creative and collective focus on how to make those. Tim Burton, there we go. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot Tim Burton did Big Eyes. Uh, You know, that movie in particular, Big Eyes, was uh, was a movie that just really twisted my head around. You know, like... It's a weird one. It's a weird one for sure. Uh, No question. It made me angry, like, as a a viewer. And I had to, like, remind myself that I was watching a movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) Um, But, like, there's... 
art is um, a good example, I guess, of another, instead of just focusing on movies, we'll do art instead. Um, have you ever heard of Who's Afraid of Red, Yellow, and Blue? No. Um, it's this beautiful art piece. I don't remember the artist. Um, you'll have to look it up at some point. If you're listening to this, look it up, you know, um, and you'll probably see what I'm about to say next because it's everywhere. Uh, there's about, I think, 12 or 13 different versions of Who's Afraid of Red, Yellow, and Blue. And the fourth version was cut in its entirety. It was slashed up. It was murdered. It was killed uh, because it did not conform to standard uh, beliefs uh, about art. And you think, Hmm. well, that's crazy. Like, when did this happen? Like, 1800s? This happened in 2014. Um, wow. So it was never released? No, it was released. It, it was, was released. It was public. But and it, people but went was... into the gallery and slashed it. Wow. Because they don't agree with what's being shown there. They think modern art is a plague. See, that's what interests me. I've, o- I've always been interested in the people that take that leap, that, that, that throw something out there that's so crazy that it's rejected. You know what I mean? Because, uh, I, I mean... We could talk about our mutt if you want to, um, <laughs> but the fountain. Uh, do you know this? No, I don't know. So um, his name's not our mutt. There's actually a name, uh, but it's kind of an inspiration for a lot of my art. It, I haven't shown off any of it because it's so weird, and I know it's weird, <laughs> um, but uh, – there is a, I think it's 1918, 1919, it might be 1921. Um, there was this piece that was uh, submitted to the New York Art Gallery, uh, which was held over by a committee that decided on what was going to be put in the art gallery. And they decided if it was allowed. Mm. And this urinal was sent in, and all it had on the side was our mud. It was just a You urinal. know what? I have heard of this. Yeah. Okay, yes. So, and, and people were like debating whether or not it was art. Like it was Yeah. So this is yeah. um the guy who made it, I can't remember his name. I'm so sorry. It was an internet trend for a little while, I think. Uh it crazier than that. It started an entire art movement. But um <laughs> the uh the guy who made it, um he was also on that committee. So the argument that he made as soon as it came up was like, who are you to decide if that's art? Like what, what's your qualifications? Why do you get to choose this? It's art to somebody. Otherwise they wouldn't have submitted it. Right. Um, and that I think is really bold, uh, and something that is what intrigues me. And that spawned Dadaism, which is this whole idea that there's no definition to art in general, and there's no way to define it. Uh, and if you try to define it, you fail at defining what art is. And so you have things like the, there's a, the Dadaist film. I can't remember what it's called. I'm so bad with names. I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, but it's just a floating head spinning around with random shots. And it just says Dada is not Dada for like an hour and 30 minutes. Um, and that's it. Um, there's this. I think I remember hearing about that too. Yeah, there's a collective <laughs> loss of the idea of weird uh, and strange. And there, there's some out there like, I like, uh, you know, John Woo, for example, he's, he's weird. If you saw Malignant, you know what I'm talking about. It's not as weird as this stuff, but it's there. Um, and you just, we need to push for more odd and strange things and push for more, self-vision and self-actualization in art uh, because people think like, oh, well, it's kind of weird. Nobody's going to like it. Who cares? Who cares if it like it? Like it, you made it for you. You're not making it for everybody else. You're not making it because you want people to like you. You make it because it's something that you enjoy. Yeah, it's almost, I mean, whenever you describe that um, and I kind of look at some of the stuff that I've created that uh, was sort of rejected or like ended up influencing my f- my circle of friends in a in a negative way what talking I, about woke olympics yes yes <laughs> about the woke olympics um what what sort of became uh like revealed to me through those experiences at least was that 
the perception is bigger than any one person. And so whenever you know people create something that's hated, it's typically because they're highlighting something that probably has a lot of truth to it. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, historians and uh, you know intellectuals that are rejected by the intellectual community purely because they're you know highlighting a certain fundamental truth that ex- that exists maybe not in the same maybe not in like a hundred percent the the you know the most accurate light but they're highlighting a a uh, a, a truth that exists and so something that you were talking about with uh, you know the urinal piece of art and the argument that like well what how do you get to decide what's art um th- that in itself the the creation of that argument and the um thought bubble that sort of uh became part of a culture at that point the artistic culture it in a lot of ways deconstructed the um uh, like the, a preconceived notion. Of... Well, the external uh, influences on art. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it, yeah, yeah. It, it opened up art even more because it reached some boundary and pushed beyond and it exposed a truth that was un uh, that was that didn't exist before. You know what I mean? You want to talk about Alex Jones? <laughs> no, no hold on i actually have something <laughs> to bring up about him okay <laughs> um so you know i think the the thought on that is really good i think that there's still needs to be skepticism on things that are released in that regard of course because of, for of course yeah because you have something like alex jones who has right conspiracy ev- theory theories just run rampant just like in the yeah. same way that that sort of artistic movement would just run rampant and but like he also had some truths in there is the thing mm. um for everybody likes to make fun of turning the frogs gay right they kind of were uh, not in at all the way he was saying. Uh, it was a pesticide that was being released in like one pond or like one river. Yeah, uh, I actually took a philosophy of water class here at UNT, and we learned about the study that, yeah. that uh, he was citing. And what it was is it was a river, and it was in London, and it was um, it was a pretty well known river. And what they what they figured out was that uh, some of the pollutants that existed in the water supply in this river um, had uh, an estrogenetic effect on the offspring of uh, toads. So yeah, it's it's super interesting. But also, it's not a conspiracy that people were trying to turn people and frogs gay yeah yeah. you know the, the, so like the study debunked that because they were trying to figure out whether or not this polluted river lo- leaking into the water supply was actually going to cause harm to people and so in the study it does a it does a parts per million water analysis yeah. and it, it ends up like explaining that the the effect on humans would be minimal but for this particular species of toads it actually did hermaphrodite some of them yeah which is is crazy that he was you know it was somewhat true information he was just spewing it in a way that was not true which right. is why mm-hmm. and i know here's the thing in my opinion alex jones's art um and that's because uh, he has so much theatrics involved. He he labels himself as news, but I really think he's like a performance. Right? He he's the male equivalent of Kim Kardashian. <laughs> yeah, you know I what mean, I mean. Look, like, or just the Kardashians in general. Like, I mean, yeah. it, it's just it's uh, it's like watching a it's like watching a train wreck. Like you know what's gonna happen, but you can't look away. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he's he is so incredibly entertaining, and I hate that I have to say that because I think he's a horrible human being, right. and he's <laughs> terrible for the world in general. But like, 
you know how many times I quote some of the stupidest things he says? Because they're hilarious. Like, there's no right. way that some one man can be this funny and also this wrong at the same time. It's supposed to be entertainment. And people have a disconnect, I think, like the average listener. I think he has a disconnect. Well, he definitely does. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, you know, his entire show, it, it's, it, it is entertaining, but it's like hardly anything else. In the same way that, like, I wouldn't listen to a comedian for life advice. I'm listening to a comedian to get a laugh. In the same way, you wouldn't, like, actually listen to Alex Jones, Alex Jones as a news outlet. I mean, he, he, and yet you could ironically, but like, yeah. <laughs> but but there's a section of society that take him seriously, which yeah. is a problem. But which is why we have to think critically about everything we consume, right? right? Yeah. Otherwise, you end up with, oh, Alex Jones is cool, you know? Um, right. He's not. He's horrible. Don't <laughs> don't think he's cool. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's. He's like infomercials on steroids. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to explain him. Holy shit. That's really good. Um, but so that's, uh, you know, like while you there's things like, you know, woke Olympics out there that probably deal with a fundamental truth somewhere in there. You have to be critical of what's being said. Um, and so if some people are like, well, this speaks to the opposite of what I like, uh, that's them, you know, Um see it as entertainment then it's you know like i think i'm not going to give alex jones money let's be real this is a very different level um but like right you have to treat it as like oh wow this is so ridiculous like ancient aliens you know like right yes sure there's some weird things that happened a long time ago that somehow like these people over here and these people over there have the same thing who knows what happened but i don't think aliens came down and were like we'll show you how to make a pyramid no like <laughs> right yeah and and kind of going back to the music thing you were talking about um specifically like with the woke olympics uh i feel like it's something that i'm probably never gonna ever like i, I probably will always have to address it from whatever circle i find myself in you know what i mean yeah but um i I wrote that album and the this, this more provocative songs in that album specifically to get an emotional reaction. I, I mean, like it, it was intentional. I was not doing it with like the naivety that like, oh, I'm going to get this out because this is how I feel about it. Or malice. Um, right? right, or malice. It was, uh, it was the same way that like a death metal band writes a song about you know, Vikings raping and pillaging or like, um, or, or like Metallica talking about stepping on a landmine. Right. Or yeah. Right, like, um, or, or, or even, you know, just like the, uh, bodily, uh, dismemberment of someone and like this weird, like fucked up world that yeah, exists only in the song. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they it's don't just, think it's cool. They're doing it for an emotional response. Right. And, uh, th- I was always, you know, and I still hope this, that like anybody who does have a, a negative emotional reaction to it, realize that the rest of the songs are about like, uh, you know, very high th- level thinking concepts or like specific historical figures that actually did something positive in the world, you know? And, uh, you know, I just, the, the whole outrage culture, especially within music, like really bugs the shit out of me because anytime somebody tells me not to listen to something because of, you know, oh, they said this in a song or like, and it was bad or, oh, this person is a bad person because some rumor that exists on the internet. The first thing I want to do is like learn about it. And so... Um, it has the opposite effect. I think it has the opposite effect on most people too. It's, it's the same way whenever you, you know, tell a a kid not to have candy. It's like, (laughs) it's not going to make him want the candy any less. It's actually just going to fuel his desire for it. So yeah. What's that uh, study with kids and marshmallows, right? Where they say like you can have, or don't touch this marshmallow and I'll bring like three back for you. Right. And they always eat the marshmallow like 90% of the time because it's right there. You know, mm-hmm. um, yeah. it, it's, you gotta, 
it it uh it activates an impulsive nature of our psyche yeah and so i i generally like shy away if i see like a controversial thing unless it's something that i have some awareness of i'm like "Ah, okay whatever this is probably dumb i don't need to know the answer to this um but like you know if there's a, a whole drama about like this whole thing on the internet that I'm like s- slightly aware of and I just paid attention for a quarter second and I'm like, Oh cool. This is very stupid. I'm going to move on my way. Um, there's, we don't need to know every single little detail about every single little thing. I think that that's what is causing so many issues and like the impulsive reaction of, um, information gathering like we don't use it we don't use our phones for good information we use them for whatever like the stupidest stuff right um which or like self-imposed tragedies like people thinking they have diseases that they don't actually have you know yeah i I struggled with that a lot i was a um chronic hypochondriac there was one year where i went to the doctor like four or five times and they kept telling me i was fine so (laughs) yeah i mean i've been diagnosed with add and i have dyslexia and dysgraphia and all sorts of stuff and it's just it's infuriating to see people like oh look i'm stemming or whatever because i have adhd that's not how it works <laughs> go away <laughs> like you're just giving everybody a bad name stop it right um and, and you know what i think that's going to be another thing that we look back on like 30 or 50 years from now this era of diagnosed um mental illnesses and like uh, i'd say make it broader le- just learning disabilities like it's, yeah it, it, i think we're gonna look back on this era and realize that the medical industry really fucked us and that we were they were they were just taking full advantage of the prescription and pharmaceutical industry that existed yeah um i think even broader you just look at the instant gratification and self uh, how do I even describe this? Um, the like self importance. People think they're important. Okay. You know, like uh, the egotistical reinforcement. Yeah, and so like you know that includes with doctors too. Where I don't think that they're prescribing things maliciously. I think they just are like, oh, um, you validating know. their positions in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah, by they diagnosing, already diagnosing. You know, because oh, yeah. the way it works yeah, is. Yeah. I could see that you have uh, you have somebody who comes in who sells medicine, right? Uh, uh, pharmaceutical sales. And they say, hey, you know, we've got this medicine that works for this one specific case or like these general cases or whatever. Um, if you see any, you should try prescribing that. Uh, and then doctors like, OK. And then they look only for those cues instead of the bigger picture to make a diagnosis. Mm. That's what I think is happening because it reinforces what they've learned. Um, that, yeah, this is what I should do rather than reinforcing what they learned a long time ago, which is, okay, here's, you know, what I should be looking at in exchange. Like, w- let's, let's not just go, okay, well, you have this problem, this problem, this problem. Okay. Well, there's your diagnosis. Uh, you stop and say, okay, let's do a study on this or yeah, yeah. something like that. I think a lot of people get caught up in the hot button issues and they, over oh, yeah. they overlook a lot of the structural damage that's being done purely because they're so focused and emotionally charged about the, you know, these, these one or three things that, uh, they feel very strongly about. Yeah. Here's a good example. I think the whole Elon Musk Twitter thing is funny as fuck. <laughs> it's really funny. Like he's losing money hand over fist. It's really, really funny. I feel sorry for all those people, but I'm not angry. I'm not like, God, Elon Musk ruining Twitter. No, it's a fucking website. I don't give a shit. It's gone. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, it's the end of the world. No, yeah. fuck it. I'm but very anti-social media. I mean, I, I grew up on it, and my parents didn't know what it was, so I was sort of encouraged to be on it. And now as an adult, like the only thing I ever use social media for now in my life is for my artistic projects and, like, uh, I was off, you know, Facebook for three years and then got pressured to go back onto it. And after a year, I'm already off of it again. <laughs> yeah. you. Um, it's not productive. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't help very much. It's, I, I could go much deeper. Um, <laughs> I did a entire research study on um, uh, Cambridge Analytica when all that stuff was oh, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. right before it released. I was doing a research study on Cambridge Analytica before the stuff hit. 
Damn. Um, and I wrote up this whole paper about how they were using um, they were using these data points to uh, not do ads to like large swaths of people as ads have been do- done forever. They're hyper targeting to individuals like, hey, this guy would buy this thing if we advertised to that to him. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a sad story in the end because, uh, a month before I was releasing all my data and I had worked with, a you know, a faculty member here, uh, to do a press tour event, uh, a month before I released it, MIT released the same data I had and undercut everything that I had worked on. So, you know, it was under unfortunate timing wise, they beat me to the punch. But um, at that point, I didn't really use a ton of social media, but I deleted all of it. I deleted everything that I could because of how frightening the idea of a micro-targeted ad was. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, this is crazy. The 2016 election is when that started. It started with Bush. Um, Around that era is when they started learning how to target ads smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah, Patriot Act. Yeah. It makes total sense. Um, (laughs) Somewhat. It it was privatized Patriot Act, essentially, Uh, Um, which is why it's scarier to me because, in a sense, there's no oversight, you know? Right, yeah, Um, because it's it's under that guise of a private company and and not a public institution that can— uh, take Space. real scrutiny and legal action. Yeah, exactly. So um, I was, you know, frightened to hell by this. And I, uh, I, when I deleted everything, it was all fine. Um, I worked as a uh, field audio recorder uh, at the time. So I would do audio for short films. And a lot of people are like, you need to have your reels online. You need to have, you know, information online so people can easily to easily reach you through Instagram or whatever. I told people like my email and they would email me. Like it didn't matter. I was fine. I got gigs left and right. Hmm. Um, but it's because I knew what I was doing. I was one of the few in the area that knew what, what, what I was doing. Uh, and I wasn't charging much at all um because i still was figuring out like do i actually know what the hell i'm doing um and so like you don't even need social media for like marketing or anything like sure it's useful but you don't it's not necessary um and it i feel like not even focusing on the ads it's just not a good thing in general but the ads god they make it so much worse it's bad it's really bad um because they can say like Hey, here's, I don't, you know, here's John, John James. I don't know. (laughs) Here's John James who lives in Idaho and is really into dogs and, uh, has a pit bull of his own. Uh, he's had that pit bull for 13 years. He is like, you know, 5'11", 160 pounds, um, wants to get back to the gym but can't figure out how blah 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 blah. and they'll have all these data points on you and go like if i tell him that this one thing will solve this big problem that is in the back of his head that he barely knows about he'll buy it or you know the the big thing was they used that in the 2016 election to a really strong thing and cambridge analytica got caught because of a completely different reason because they were telling people they'd bribe and assassinate like royal family members in the middle east is a whole crazy thing um but uh and when they got caught with that it was realized that they were taking data it was this app that like you you download it on facebook and you click the button and it like tells you your top five friends or something like that something really stupid but when you click it you give it the approval to take all of your data from every website you visit as well as all of your friends' data from all the websites they visit and all of those friends' friends from all the websites they visit. And that got them kicked off the platform because they were scraping data from everybody on Facebook and they had only gotten like 100,000 people using it. Yeah, and uh, a lot of that comes in the form of like, oh, you know, um, what are your, you know, uh, who's going to be your, your your future husband or something like yeah, you know, some like dumb I, shit every time it's always the stupidest like you know 
not farm simulator stuff, but like it's it's like Essentially dumb like that. that. Yeah, yeah, it's dumber than that. Yeah, it, that that's the biggest thing that I think was a, a a tragedy of our generation is that nobody knew what this shit was, and you know, uh, I mean, I had a fucking MySpace whenever I was like ten. Yeah, hell you know yeah, know what I mean. No, let's go back to Tom. You remember Tom? <laughs> yeah. I I bet you Tom won't sell me out to big data or whatever. <laughs> you know, Tom would keep me safe. But see, like that was the thing is like we, you know. At first, it was MySpace, and then well, Friendster, then Friendster, then yeah, then MySpace, and then it got pushed into, you know, Facebook, and uh, just the social pressure to go to Facebook was so insurmountable, and nobody knew what Mark was going to allow to happen, and uh, he essentially took hardly any responsibility, um, and now we're all kind of faced with this era where companies have access to all of our trends and data points and now even google like monitors your search history everything like there's they, like a, there's they monitor thing. everything yeah th- there's that thing that like pops up it says n- now viewing live page or something yeah i don't use google um i switched to apple which uh breaking news as of today this means that you will actually be able to date when we recorded this um but uh apple is being sued because they're apparently scraping your data even though they're saying they're not um damn yeah so a- a- apple was actually my move because of the fact that they did not scrape data um i don't use it for everything uh, i have a windows computer windows computers scrape your data uh, but at the same time i have blockers installed on there and then i also use firefox which is maybe the like only thing that I trust anymore on the internet because it's open source and a nonprofit. Um, that and uh, here's a fun one for you. Uh, y'all should Google Richard Stallman. Um, uh, use Google, yeah, sure. Uh, the one <laughs> thing that's scraping your data. But Richard Stallman <laughs> was the guy who uh, invented the uh, new project, the GNU. Um, he's basically the grandfather of Linux um, and he has a just like this website he's impossible to reach literally impossible to reach you cannot reach this man if you wanted to he has a website that is on the old like like 91 92 style of websites where it's like just a text page and he just posts about like you know here's a problem with something that you won't see for 10 years and this is how it's going to fail on you and he's been doing this since like 2003 uh, and like everything he says constantly comes true. Like he's like, here's why Airbnb is going to be a plague on the housing community or like housing mm. stuff and why it might cause a crisis in the future. And we're literally seeing that right now. Um, See, that that also interests me is people that say shit. And then uh, 10, 20 years later, we are finally feeling the effects of it. Like that, that, that's, uh, you know, those figures, even if I don't necessarily agree with everything they're saying, I always try to figure out like, well, why don't I agree? And then if I can't figure out like a counter argument that makes sense, I, I listen more. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, there he's he's honestly incredible. The guy is a genius um, and hardly talked about because it's very hard to find mm. a lot of information on him. Um, but you have... Uh, you have what's very interesting in tech is there was an entire group of people like him early on um i can't remember the name but they were under collective uh that they operated and essentially they you know they argued and they had a newsletter was the big thing Uh, they had a newsletter in silicon valley before silicon valley was what we think of now um and it was pretty much like every person on that was one of the most influential people in how computers work today. Um, and they wrote about like the ethics and morals of what they were doing and, um, how it might come back to bite them in the future and things like that and how they wanted to create a better internet or a better, you know, uh, and like space for people to use computers and interact with machines Mm. um it's just unfortunate that a lot of them kind of moved on once they got paid and we're like okay whatever like you can listen to us but we're not going to fight for it we're just going to kind of yeah back off it seems to be the equalizer is money yeah (laughs) yeah um 
Well, we've come full circle with that discussion. <laughs> Very true, huh? <laughs> so I guess that's a good point to end it on. Um, thanks for listening to Hickory Street Podcast. And uh, I really enjoy doing this kind of format. So um, the next episode will probably just be a, a solo episode, but uh, I will have another guest on soon. So thanks, Dean. Yeah, see you.